All right, well, God bless you, everybody. Good to be back. <clears throat> the last time we were together, we looked at Revelation 5, and in chapters 4 and 5, we saw the Father exalted as creator and the Son exalted as redeemer. We talked about how Jesus was found worthy of honor and worthy to take and open the scroll of God. We said that this scroll likely reveals how God will send Jesus to bring the world under the authority of the Son. Now, we may not know everything that's in that scroll, but we know that as Jesus opens its seals, the plan of God begins to unfold. And we see God beginning first to allow things to happen on the earth, and then he begins to act directly on the earth to judge sin. God is ultimately going to destroy all resistance to the co coming government of Christ. All right, so now that we have arrived in chapter 6, finally, right, the speed of a snail, we're going to see Jesus opening the seven seals. And each time, as we've been saying, that Jesus opens one of the seals, we see the plan of God advancing. So if you were with us uh, in our previous courses when we were talking about Messianic prophecy and then the last course we did before this one was a survey course of end times, then you will remember that nearly all of the action here in Revelation takes place within a seven-year time frame. So that seven-year period culminates with the literal return of Jesus Christ in power and glory. Now, many people have heard about this time frame, even if they don't know much about the Bible. So for the benefit of those who haven't been with us, how do we know that this seven-year period exists? Now, we, we taught on this extensively in the Things to Come course, so if you want to do a deep dive, you can just go to our YouTube channel, uh, find that Things to Come playlist, and we do have some more in-depth discussions on the subject. I think uh, num uh, sessions three and four in particular would be where you want to focus, so we can help you with that if need be. But we can give you the basics tonight. So God showed the prophet Daniel that he had appointed a certain number of years for Israel to do certain things or to go through certain things, experience certain things. And when those years expired, then the mystery of God, his plan of salvation, would be finished. Now, the angel Gabriel told Daniel that these things were going to happen over a period of 70 sets of seven years. That's your evening tongue twister for this Wednesday. 70 sets of seven years, that's 490 years, 70 times seven. Now, when you read about that in Daniel chapter 9, your Bible may say 70 weeks. That creates a little confusion because when the Jewish people talk about weeks, they not only had weeks of days, but they also had weeks of years. So a week of days is obviously seven days, and a week of years is seven years. Now, when Jesus came the first time, he fulfilled a part of this prophecy, a very important part of this prophecy, that said that the Messiah was going to be killed after the first 69 of those 70 weeks had gone by. So this is an actual prediction. If you show this to a Jewish person, they might be very astonished, but it does say in Daniel chapter 9 that after those first weeks had expired that the Messiah would be cut off. He would be killed. And so a Jewish person has to ask himself or herself, when, when was Messiah cut off? So 69 of those 70 weeks have expired, so we know that there is one more seven-year time period remaining. And we call that remaining seven years the 70th week or the 70th week of Daniel. So again, when I say the 70th week or just the week for short, I don't mean a period of seven days, but I mean seven years. Many people call that seven-year period the tribulation period. Technically, that is incorrect, but if you use that term, people will know what you're talking about. Uh, the Lord Jesus did speak about great tribulation, but the great tribulation that Jesus taught about actually begins halfway through those seven years. In other words, three and a half years into it. So if you want to be biblically correct, uh, the next time that you're at a cocktail party and somebody starts talking about the tribulation, 
Um, you could say, hold on a minute now. Are you talking about the great tribulation mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24? Or are you talking about the entire 70th week of Daniel? <laughs> You'll be the hit of the cocktail party. So to sum that up, we know that this seven-year period exists because of what God told Daniel through the angel Gabriel. We also know that this seven-year period exists and is still future because Daniel and Revelation have a lot to say about the terrible second half of that seven years. Okay? In the middle of the last week, Jesus said the great tribulation will begin. The Antichrist, the final evil oppressor of Israel in the world, is going to rule for the second half of that week. In other words, for three and a half years. This is vitally important, and Revelation refers to that time period a number of times. But at the end of the week, at the end of the seven years, Jesus will return. This goes back to the early church as well. Some of the early church fathers taught about this pretty explicitly. Uh, one of these men, Hippolytus of Rome, he wrote the first commentary that we have really on the book of Daniel around the year 200 AD. And it's amazing to me that we still have some of this stuff. It would be tantalizing for us to be able to, to uncover more of it, but we, we have what we have, I guess. And in his commentary on, on Daniel, writing about 200, Hippolytus said, for when Christ has come, and the gospel is preached in every place, the times being then accomplished, there will only remain one week, the last, in which Elijah will appear and Enoch, and in the midst of it, the abomination of desolation will be manifested. That is, Antichrist announcing desolation to the world. So, I just share things like that with you because I don't want you to think that this is something I made up in my office at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Okay? What we're going to look at now is the opening of the seals. In my opinion, what the seals show is God permitting evil to proceed at the end of the age. God does not, at least in my opinion, uh, you don't have to believe this way, but in my opinion, I think we can deduce that God is not directly judging through the first few seals, but he allows his plan to be advanced as mankind and the devil are committing evil. I also believe that the beginning of the seals marks the beginning of the week, the beginning of the 70th week. Not everybody believes that, but that's what I think. So just before we talk about the opening of the seals, I want you to have an understanding of the course of the flow of those judgments of God in the book of Revelation. So we see God's activities being released through those seven seals on the scroll as Jesus opens them. But then following the, the, the seven seals, you have seven trumpets and then finally seven bowls, which come, uh, I believe, in consecutive order. So it's just a little quickie chart diagram thing there for you. So again, the seals do not seem to be direct judgments of God, but rather they are God allowing evil in his permissive will. Why? Because the time has now come for his program of salvation and for his judgments to be completed. We talked about that in Revelation chapter 5. Apparently there is a time appointed. God has times and seasons that are in his heart that are not shared with us. But when the time for that has come, then God begins this process of, of, of taking his power to himself and now reigning openly. So we could say that in the seals, evil begins to come to its fullness. We might also say that in the seals, we see a, a lifting of God's restraint against the evil of men. A lot of what we see in the seals, although it is judgment in that sense, it is not the wrath of God. God is not the direct actor. He is allowing people, if I could just say it bluntly, to just to go at it, okay? It is the wrath of men against men, <clears throat> or it is the wrath of the devil and the Antichrist as well. But nevertheless, uh, I hope you know that God uses even those things for his purposes, the Bible says in Psalm 76, it says, surely the wrath of man will praise you. So even the evil that man intends, that the devil intends, God uses those things to accomplish his own purposes. 
However, even if the seals are not the direct judgments of God, they are still terrifying and still cataclysmic. Once the world enters the final seven-year period, things are going to start shifting dramatically. Jesus called um, that first half of the week the beginning of sorrows. And literally the word that he was using there for sorrows, it's, it's birth pangs. It is the beginning of birth pangs. And as birth pangs will do, the deeper we get into the process, uh, the more pronounced and painful and frequent they become. And so it's a very interesting choice of words on the Lord Jesus' part. Now the seals are opened in order. There are seven of them, as we've been saying. But in the mercy of God, the seventh seal is not an event per se. It's actually like a container that contains what follows, the seven trumpets. The trumpets are powerful judgments, which also, as the name implies, they serve as a warning of the wrath that is going to follow. And in the same way, again, in the mercy of God, the seventh trumpet is not so much of an event in and of itself, but it's just another announcement, another container. And when the seventh trumpet is sounded, then seven angels come forth to pour out seven bowls that contain the wrath of God. Now, if you read the old King James Bible, do we have any King James aficionados left in the room? Okay, some of you still read King James. So King James calls these vials, but the word is really like a, like a bowl. It's a shallow dish. We'll talk about that when we get to it. And the bowls are the culmination of God's wrath. It's the wrap-up. This is his, what we call his eschatological wrath, meaning his end time wrath, his final wrath. This is his wrath that will destroy the world. When I say destroy the world, I don't mean destroy the planet like a bad science fiction movie. I mean it destroys the systems of the world. Now the earth has only seen such a worldwide outpouring of wrath one other time, and that was the flood of Noah. And the Apostle Peter says this, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. That's from 2 Peter 3. So these judgments will be God's just reward on a world that has turned away from him completely and has rebelled against everything that's good. I mean, as terrifying as they are to read about, though, God is totally righteous to judge the nations in this way for their sin in general and for the many crimes they've committed against his commands and his people. So we've talked about this before a little bit, but everybody who now says, well, if there is a God, why doesn't he do something about evil? Uh, those folks will one day regret being so flip about it as they see the judgments of God being poured out. And the Bible, of course, says that many are going to curse God rather than repent. They're already cursing him now, aren't they? And he's barely even touching the world uh, in judgment at all. What will it be like when he arises, as the Bible says, to shake the earth? I mean, we think that an 8.0 or a 9.0 on the Richter scale is terrifying, and it is. But wait until people see what a 14 looks like. Many will justify God and turn to him. In other words, they will, they will say that God is just in what he's doing. Uh, they will realize that what God is doing is righteous. Many, of course, will not acknowledge this. And God's purpose in this, friends, you know, is not vindictive. It is, as always, loving. He is working to clear the world of every obstacle that is exalting itself against him and against the Messiah. In, in Isaiah 2, we read, and the, the loftiness, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols he shall utterly abolish, 
And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Powerful language from Isaiah chapter 2. And we will see in just a moment when we read it how John describes that very scene, that very scenario, um, when the sixth seal is opened. And so, again, I just want to reemphasize to you that when you're reading Revelation, you are seeing amplifications and really commentary on what the prophets have already said about the coming of God to the world. All right, let's talk about the four horsemen now. So as we turn our attention to the seals, I need to mention a couple more things. So we are going to see that the first four seals are different from the others. Each of these first four seals is represented by a horse and a rider, possibly a couple of riders, actually. The symbol of a horse speaks of things being suddenly released, right? So a, a galloping horse was just about the fastest thing that anybody could see in the ancient world, right, if you think of it. Each horse is a different color. It has a rider, and it represents something particular. The rider is the person or the thing, the symbolic picture of the thing that is being released into the earth when the seal is opened. Although some say that this is just limited to the Middle East and the area there around Israel, others would think of it as being worldwide. And it is this chapter in the Bible <clears throat> that has given us this famous expression, which even people in the world know, of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is where it comes from. Again, I believe that Jesus opens these four seals at the beginning of the week or close to it. Some say that they start in the middle of the week, and if you believe that way, that's okay as well. Uh, just a reminder, when I say the week, I am referring to the seven-year period that ends with Christ's return. I'm talking about Daniel's 70th week. But Jesus talked, remember, about the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs happening before the Great Tribulation. So I believe that those initial seals, let's say seals one through four, they are the beginning of sorrows. And I do have a reason for saying that, which may become clear in a few minutes. But let's, let's look together. Let's break this down. Revelation 6, verse by verse. John says in verse 1, he's, he's now um, taking his, his gaze as being pulled away from the scene of Christ receiving glory and acclamation. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The first thing we should always notice about these events, the timing of these events, is in the control of Jesus the Lamb. Throughout Revelation, it is not the devil or the Antichrist who is in charge of events. It is God. God decides when the week begins. God throws the devil down to the earth when he is ready. God chooses the timing of each seal and trumpet and bowl of wrath. And in each of these first four seals now, we're going to see that it's one of these four zoa, the four living creatures. These are the throne angels, if you remember, these impossibly powerful cherubs who are a part of the throne of God, it seems, and actually bear up the throne of God themselves. <clears throat> They're the ones who tell John to come and see what's happening. So at a time of God's choosing, then Jesus will open the first seal and begin this time of trial for the world. John is summoned to look, and as he does so, he sees the first horse. It's a white horse, and a man is seated on it. Uh, in my opinion, and most conservative Bible commentators would say the same thing, this represents the Antichrist coming to prominence at the beginning of the week. So he comes to prominence at this point. And he has several characteristics. He has a bow, which appears to be empty. There's no arrow in it that we can see. 
Um, I think this tells us that he has the ability to make war, but perhaps he also deceives people through diplomacy. I think we know that that's true from the Old Testament. But I still think it's wrong to say that the Antichrist comes solely as a man of peace. People have picked this idea up, but it's not biblically accurate. Yes, he does make a, or agree to a covenant for seven years, Israel's a part of that, but that doesn't necessarily make it a peace treaty. It may be a peace treaty as between him and Israel, if you follow me, but not necessarily with his dealings with others. In fact, the Bible tells us that he is involved in many wars. We can read about that in Daniel. And here, in fact, um, John tells us that he goes out conquering and to conquer. And then a crown is given to him. Uh, I believe this will speak of the authority that Antichrist ultimately receives uh, from the ten kings who are going to arise at the end of the age. So without getting too far ahead of ourselves, we will read about these ten kings in Daniel and in Revelation. So for now, just be aware that Antichrist doesn't come out of nowhere. He receives power from these ten kings as well as, of course, from Satan. So here's an interesting thing. Many people are expecting always, I always hear Christians speculating, making videos, talking and teaching about the Antichrist uh, coming along soon, about to come forth. But the Bible, uh, although he may be coming soon, the Bible doesn't say that the Antichrist comes first. He does not. There must first be this government or this grouping of 10 kings because they are the ones who will ultimately give their authority to the Antichrist. And many people miss that. It's important. I think he's a warrior. The crown that he receives in Greek, this is the Stephanos crown that we have mentioned before. That was the crown that was awarded, uh, for example, in the Olympics to, to victors, to conquerors. Some have claimed that the white horse rider is Jesus and that this represents the activity of Jesus throughout history, but this seems very unlikely to me. For one thing, that would mean that you have Jesus in heaven causing Jesus to ride on the earth, and we know that Jesus doesn't have a twin. So uh, besides that, all of these seals represent calamities, really, for the human race. Jesus does ride a white horse in Revelation 19, but here in Revelation 6, this is the time when you have the beginning of the activity of the one who is seeking to replace Jesus Christ, to usurp the place of Jesus, and that's the Antichrist. You know, a question that people often ask is whether we're going to know. Would people, if you're alive at that time, would you know that this has happened? Would you know that the 70th week has begun? And we'll talk more about the Antichrist in Revelation 13, but he will make or confirm or strengthen a seven-year agreement with Israel and with many other nations. That would be a sign that the final week has begun. In the middle of the week is when he begins his reign of terror. And so that would be very obvious to everyone in the world, even if they couldn't discern the beginning of the week, the beginning of the seven years, right? So it might be hard to pinpoint that uh, exactly. It's interesting to me that when Jesus is asked by his disciples, they said, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The sign that Jesus focuses on, the big sign, is not the signing of an agreement. The sign that he focuses on is the abomination of desolation, the desecration of the temple that happens in the middle. That would be the unmistakable sign. Jesus did not point to the beginning of the week. He pointed to the middle of the week. I bet you're all wishing you had your protein before you came. So we need a vending machine in here. Who do I talk to about that? Pastor Kim, I'm going to vend you justice. All right. So now Jesus will open the second seal. When he, verse 3 says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. 
and there was given to him a great sword. So red, obviously, is a color of alarm, bloodshed, war, and so forth. And we are told very plainly here that this rider is removing peace from the earth. So this seems to be a general outbreak of war in the world. It's going to be terrible given the advancements, if you want to call them that, the advancements that we have made in technology and weaponry in particular. And we haven't had general war in the world since 1945. Um, perhaps not every nation in the world will be involved right away, but it will be terrible when that happens. Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. All right, so we're going to need to unpack that. The third horse, the black horse, stands for famine. And there will be massive famines in various places of the world, possibly everywhere. Denarius was a coin, is like an ounce or so, or I can't remember now, half an ounce of silver. It represented about a day's wages for a working man at this time in the Roman Empire. So think of it as a day's pay. So this may be saying that it will take people an entire day's pay just to get their bread. Now some of you are saying, hey, I think we're almost there, but um, things are not quite that bad yet. Uh, the word translated here as a quart was an ancient um, unit of measurement that was a little bit smaller than our quart or a liter. So imagine working an entire day and all that you earn is enough for a loaf of bread. Or maybe you could get more barley, it seems, but that was not considered as desirable a food uh, to eat. And interestingly, the oil and the wine uh, seem to be unaffected, and that could mean that as as has often happened in history, luxury goods would continue to be available for the wealthy. Verse 7 says, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. So is that another rider or a, a horse number five? It's not really clear what that looks like. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The last horse is pale, although that may not be the best translation. The word in Greek is chloros, which really means green. So this is where we get words that we have, such as chlorine and chlorophyll. So this is a sickly looking horse and it's greenish. It looks like death, perhaps from plague. And in fact, indeed, the rider is death and he is accompanied by Hades or hell. So in other words, we can, we can deduce here that many people are going to be brought into hell by means of all these horrible forms of death that are going to be sweeping the earth, right? We know historically in the ancient world, they certainly understood that whenever there's war, there's famine. It just follows, follows very naturally. Whenever society breaks down, we know there's disease, there's plagues. Things become so bad that even the animals kill people perhaps out of hunger. So the end result of this seal or perhaps of the four seals together is is the death of, the, of a fourth of the world, or perhaps it could mean that these things are taking place in an area that is one-fourth of the world. So this, this could mean that, uh, again, that these things, at least at this stage, are confined mainly to the Middle East. So uh, I, I think all of us here understand that if that were to happen, it'd be very unlikely that the rest of the world would just be watching, though, as a spectator, right? So um, we could all do the sad mathematics on this if we like, considering that our world population is, is about 8 billion. John could be indicating to us here that 2 billion people are going to, to have died from all of these horrible events before we even get to the middle of the week. So this is horrendous. 
So in verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Now, to me, I believe that this shows us uh, a picture from heaven's perspective uh, of the great tribulation, or at least the start of it, which begins in the middle of the week. So at that time, the Antichrist is going to become fully empowered by Satan, and we'll talk about that in a subsequent week. But in a great rage, we know that he's going to begin then to persecute all Jews and all believers in Jesus. He's going to enter the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem and declare himself to be greater than all gods. We learn this from Daniel. We learn this from the Gospels. We learn this from Second Thessalonians. He's going to demand the allegiance of everyone, and anyone who refuses him is subject to being put to death. Now in heaven we see those who have been slain for the word and their testimony. That means that they don't violate the word of God. It means that they have confessed Jesus Christ instead of the Antichrist and will not yield to the pressure to give up their faith. They ask God, how long is it going to be before God avenges their blood? So I don't think this means that they are vindictive, but it does mean that they want to see God's perfect kingdom of justice finally come to the earth, and they know it's going to be soon. But in his own wisdom, God knows, of course, how many he will allow to be martyred. All right, now we have something very dramatic, which is really the announcement uh, of the wrath of God coming on the way. So in verse 12, it says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. So sackcloth was the coarse garments that they had, like, like we would say burlap. And it was something that people wore in a time of mourning. Sometimes it was made out of goat's hair. And so when he says, as black as sackcloth of hair, he's talking about that very uh, deep, like obsidian color, super dark black color that they would get from goat's hair. And the moon became like blood. <clears throat> and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So the sixth seal gives us or shows to us this famous sign which was often recorded by the Old Testament prophets and by Christ himself of the sun being turned to darkness and the moon to blood. There's a tremendous earthquake, many other celestial signs that we don't understand. However, when we look back in the Old Testament texts, which uh, kind of inform us about this a little more deeply, Isaiah 24, for example, seems to tell us that this is a massive change in the earth, perhaps our position in the heavens. We don't know how it works. Maybe it's a change in our rotation upon uh, the earth's axis. You know, <clears throat> as freaky as it is to think about it, we are spinning literally at 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, we, don't, we don't think about that. But any disturbance of the way we move would, of course, be catastrophic. Like, thank God nobody's been tapping the brakes, right? Um, so uh, in Isaiah chapter 24, which is uh, scholars sometimes refer to as Isaiah's little apocalypse, um, I think we see a reference to these events because it's talking about the day of the Lord. So Isaiah 24, I'm giving that reference starting in verse 18, it says, The windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. I think we know what that looks like, right? And shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high 
the host of exalted ones, and on the earth, the kings of the earth. So notice, judgment activity is coming from the Lord that involves both wicked people on the earth and wicked ones in the heavens as well. Very interesting. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. Now, that's really interesting. If you know how revelation works, right? This takes you all the way into the millennium and the binding of Satan in the millennium at the very end when Jesus has returned. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign upon Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before, meaning in front of, his elders gloriously. Isn't that interesting? So you could see the, the little bits of, of reflections there of, of the things that we've seen already in Revelation 5, 4, 5, and 6. <clears throat> All right, so moving on, what happens when these cosmic signs take place? Well, what John is about to say to us is something that we just read a moment ago in the other section of Isaiah we read in Isaiah 2. It says, the kings of the earth, in Revelation 6.15, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So, as I know you've heard me say before, the astonishing thing here to me is that the people will actually know what is happening and who is causing it. That's astounding. People will know that it is God who is sending and about to send judgment. So the cosmic signs here of the sixth seal, they are the signal that the wrath of God is about to be poured out on the earth. And following this, now the trumpets and bowls will be coming. So um, we have read before in Isaiah 2, as I just said, about the day of the Lord. And it seems that it's another look at Revelation Six, I believe it is. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of men shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And, and so forth. They shall go into the holes of the rocks. The prophets refer often to the day of the Lord. It would be a great study for you uh, to go and just look that up on your own. Get that Bible software going. Or go to a site like uh, Blue Letter Bible. And actually look up the phrase, the day of the Lord. Now sometimes... The day of the Lord or in that day has an immediate application. But most of the time, the big picture is that when you look at those references to the day of the Lord, you are seeing what happens at the end of the age. That it is that mirror of the flood when God is bringing the whole world into judgment. It, it's almost like um, it is, uh, to use the phrase day of, it doesn't mean necessarily it's one day. It's not a one 24-hour day. But it's almost like court being in session. It's the day of Yahweh when Yahweh comes, brings his court into session and executes judgment in accordance with his decrees against evil. So when you look up passages that pertain to the day of the Lord, you will usually see a reference to the signs of the sun being turned to darkness and the moon being turned to blood. Uh, the constellations not shining and so forth. So sometimes there's a reference to other changes in outer space. So I think this is more than smoke and pollution. This is supernatural darkness. And what it does is it paves the way for the great contrast, which Jesus said, after these things happen, then they will see the sign of the Son of Man coming in great power and glory. Nobody can say that God doesn't know how to set up a scene dramatically, right? If God shrouds the entire planet in a supernatural, terrifying darkness, and then all of a sudden, boom, a blaze of the glory of God that is so bright that it brightens the world. God knows how to set up a scene, amen? So we don't know completely what these signs will entail, but it will be powerful, severe, and awesome. So you can go and read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah. They all talk about the day of the Lord. Um, many of those references talk about these signs of the darkness. Jesus mentioned the same things in Matthew 24. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But what it will do is it will completely focus, focus people's attention on the coming wrath of God. And um, just, 
just to, to wrap it up, I will say, if you've never noticed it before, that there is really a fascinating correspondence, the way these things line up between the seals that we've just seen in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24. So the six seals line up, they seem to line up, with Jesus' brief description of the end of the age in Matthew 24. So uh, some of you might have noticed that. It's been staring us in the face uh, our whole Christian lives, but some of us haven't seen it. In Matthew 24, remember Jesus was questioned by his disciples. They said, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then the Lord proceeds to give us this thumbnail sketch of the events before his return. But there is a correspondence there between the words that Jesus shared, for example, in Matthew 24, and the first six seals. So uh, I made you a small chart there. The first thing that Jesus mentioned is false Christs. Okay, what is the first seal? It is that white horse rider that goes out conquering and to conquer. The next thing Jesus said, you're going to see, or you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. What's the second horse? It's the red horse of war. The next thing Jesus says, there will be famines and pestilences in different places. And what are the next seals? The black horse of famine and the green horse of death or plague. Then Jesus said, then you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, he said, and they'll deliver you up. And then what do we see at the fifth seal? We see the martyrdom. And then Jesus talked about the same things that the Old Testament prophets had said about the sun and so forth and the heavenly signs. And that's what we have in the sixth seal. That seems very convincing to me. People debate about it. One thing I know for sure, uh, as with all these things, time will tell. <laughs> But church, um, look how faithful God is to tell us and to tell people what is happening, what is coming ahead of time. Uh, there are terrible days that will be coming to the world someday, but we can know from the word of God that God is totally just. The Bible says he will judge the world in righteousness. But in God's faithfulness, because of God's faithfulness, the believers of those days will be able to tell unbelievers what is coming next upon the world. And so many will be warned, many will be saved. Why? Because God has told us all about it ahead of time. I love how Jesus says, see, I have told you beforehand. So we, we serve a mighty God, a holy God, and he is a God who's going to order all things according to his will and all of these things will take place in his timing and only in his timing. So when we read about these powerful judgments, let's live holy, as we read before uh, in the words of 2 Peter 3. And let's, let's work and let's pray that as many as, uh, of our friends and loved ones as possible can come to a living faith and can come to a place of assurance that they know that they have received uh, the gift of salvation through Christ. So there are so many facets um, to see of this. It's not just God's justice and wrath and holiness. It's also God's love, God's faithfulness to call people to repent, God's care for his church. As we saw in the letters in chapters two and three in our Saturday session, God's intimate knowledge of each one of us and God's encouragement of each one of us to, to hold on to him, to strengthen the things that remain and to press on so that we can be the overcomers. And this is, this is a consistent message that if you look for it, you're going to find that uh, in every chapter of the book, really. So, so, amen. So that's what I had to share tonight. Miraculously, it is 8.01. So we'll take, uh, we'll take a few questions. Ms. Marianne. Hello. It's not a race. We can get you all. I, I told Frank I had no questions, but I have one. You said, um, and I'm looking for it in my notes. I can't find it. Uh, where you talked about God's wrath on, on people in the heavenlies. That was your question, too? Okay. Yeah, um, not, not people in the heavenlies, but those, those principalities and powers. The, the, the wicked spirits, the, the fallen angels, because those things are, those issues are also going to be resolved. So we'll see later when we move uh, into chapter 12, we'll see that there is war in heaven. 
So in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years, there's, there is that war in heaven, and God will, will clear the atmosphere of that satanic opposition that is, that is in the heavenlies. So that's when Satan and his angels are, are cast down uh, to the earth. In Revelation 12. So we got, we got a couple weeks to go before we get two weeks from tonight. Hi. I thought she was going to ask my question, and, and maybe she did differently. Uh, but just an observation, Matthew 24 is where we look at our correspondence to what's going on in Revelation. And the little apocalypse is Isaiah 24. So Isaiah 24 says it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones. So that's a little disconcerting. Does that mean self-exalted or exalted by man as opposed to exalted by God or, you know, saved? Yeah. No, I think that is a reference to principalities and powers because what follows upon that is him saying that he's going to shut them up in the prison, which we know from once Christ returns, we know that Satan is shut up in the abyss for a thousand years, so it, it does really seem to dovetail nicely with, with what we know about the Lord's return to the earth. So, yeah, it's good. Mike? Thank you. Um, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah all refer to um, I, um, the Rev book of Revelation in prophecy and writing. To what extent do you think... Uh, under they, they were under, under the unction of the Holy Spirit to write and prophesy all these things. But to what extent do you think these men actually knew, like really had a vision for what was going to happen in the end times? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I think it's like puzzle pieces, right? I think they had a scenario. I think they knew what the basic scenario was. Um, and that goes back quite a ways. Um, even if you go into the Psalms, so David wrote, you know, just about half the Psalms, and even in the Psalms of David, you can see that he has an expectation that Yahweh is literally coming to destroy the wicked. He has an understanding of the wars that are going to take place at the end of the age and who the participating nations are going to be. And he sees, you know, Yahweh as the storm rider who comes on the clouds and so forth. So he might not have had all the, the detail which, which we would have now because we have a completed Bible, but he had the scenario. And even Moses had pieces of the scenario all the way back, you know, 1400, 1500 years before Jesus. Even Moses had a part of it. Moses understood all the way back in the Torah that these calamities were going to come upon Israel at the end of the age until their power was shattered, until he said, the, until the power of the holy people is shattered. So I guess what I'm driving at is they had, they had a basic scenario or a basic understanding of certain things. And then as God went on through time, God kept adding detail and detail and detail. So Job even whom many people would consider that to be the, the oldest book in the Bible. Job has an anticipation that he is literally going to see Yahweh on the earth in his resurrected body. He says, and though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom my eyes will see and not another. So here's the possibly oldest book in the Bible, a guy writing this at the time of Abraham or thereabouts, and he has an understanding. He already knows that he's going to be raised from the dead and literally in his resurrected body, literally see Yahweh. Now we know that that is Christ, you know, incarnate. Is he seeing Yahweh the Son, right? But it just shows you that all the way back they had the scope, they had the outline of it. And so as we walk forward, we get more and more detail. Just like when we're talking about salvation through the Messiah's death, right? All the way back in Genesis, you have the promise that God's going to send the seed of a woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent, right? But now when we come forward 
few thousand years into, into Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, right? Isaiah now has the marvelous portrait of Messiah's suffering and so forth, you know? Um, so we just keep adding to it, getting more detail, getting more detail. And then John is not giving us great detail, as I have said many times here, because they already had the detail. John's just giving us a little bit of detail and giving us the heavenly perspective, what it looks like from topside, right? So that's, that's a great question. It's just interesting to see how God just kept feeding us that information. So, yeah. Frank. Thank you. Uh, she, she had my first question. When John wrote all this, I mean, whatever language he was writing in, if it was in Hebrew or Greek or whatever, he was writing in Greek, okay? But, now when Jesus talks about this in, in Matthew, he's giving us like a one-page synopsis of what, you know, this is a short version. So when John is in the spirit, he's in heaven, and he's seeing all of these things taking place, but what he's really, they're not taking place, this is what will take place, right? I mean, it sounds like, you know, overwhelming uh, thing to see, sure. okay? But then he said, okay, he sees all of this, but the whole purpose is for him to write it. But it was in Greek, right? Yeah, okay, that's... Okay, is there a question or...? Well, it is a preview, but it's a but it's a specific preview because the the book itself is not, um, as I said, the book is not designed to be, and th this takes me back, and I don't want to be repetitive because I know I've said this before, so bear with me. But um, Revelation is not designed to be the place that you go to learn the details about the end times, because John's audience, if you're a first century Jew. You already had the details about the end times. You're just getting a little bit of additional detail, and you're getting the encouragement from Christ. You're getting um, what God wants you to know so that you will overcome, so that you will hang in there, so that you will not deny the faith, right? So it is being written to people who were in active persecution and also written to the people of the future who would face these severe temptations to you know, well, ultimately, it will be to receive the mark or to just fall away in general to false worship. So, but the point of the book is, is to encourage so that we can overcome. That's really, the, that's really the point. The point is not so much to teach us about end times, but to encourage our hearts about the end times. You have... Yeah. Right. No doubt that God wanted to preserve him so that the Lord could complete whatever he had planned for the canon of Scripture. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Somebody else. Okay. Now it's time to st stretch the knees, work those knees. Hi. Good evening. My question is from Matthew 24 20. The verse says, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. The verses leading into that talk about people, uh, if you are in Judea, flee to the mountains, let whom is on the housetop not go down, and let him who is in the field not go back, but woe to those who are pregnant. And he ends with, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So my question is this, I don't know where or why, but since I was a child, I had this idea that at the end times there would be a great like, flight of believers to Jerusalem, that we would run to Jerusalem at the last times and, and that would be part of like how and when we would be saved. I don't know where I got that in my head. But I read this verse and he does mention the flight. So I'm wondering what that is because from what we've learned in the class, there doesn't seem to be this great flight of believers to Jerusalem. Yeah, in fact, uh, quite the opposite. Most people, 
unless you know God tells them personally something different. Jesus is warning the Jewish people who were there at that time to, to flee and get out, and which which also which also tallies with a lot of what's in the Old Testament that there will be places uh, of refuge for them. So in uh, Edom and Moab, so what we would call Jordan and Saudi Arabia and some of those areas. And God actually gives, um, in Zechariah, he's telling them how the mountain's going to split and that they should flee through the valley that is created by this earthquake and just head um, you know, to the east in order to be safe from that. So most people are going to flee because what's happening in the middle of the week is the Antichrist desecrating the temple and he's basically declaring open season, right? It is open season on, on all Jewish people in his mind. And so all Jewish people are going to flee. Now, with that, there will be some who will be there who will be preserved in safety. But in general, as Jesus is saying, when you see those things, and, and of course, this is something at that time, it's going to have a worldwide application, but it's especially critical for the ones, for the Jewish people who are there in that immediate area, they need to get out because the Antichrist is really going to make the temple area and make Jerusalem his throne, his capital. It's an insult to God because he knows that that is the city of Messiah that God, that God has chosen to reign from. And so he wants that uh, as his own. And so that's, maybe we could say that that's like the epicenter, right, of trouble and persecution for, for the Jewish people. But even with that, the Bible does indicate that God's going to preserve some of them there, even in Jerusalem. And not to get too far ahead of us, but it's, some of that I think has to do with the, with the ministry of the two witnesses uh, in, in Revelation 11. So God's going to allow the two witnesses, empower them to, to oppose Antichrist directly. So God will have a witness even there all the way to the end of the age. So, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. But um, Jewish people will be, uh, unfortunately, they will be in hiding again, like as in the Holocaust. Because when the millennium begins, we can read in Isaiah 60 how the people from the Gentile nations are going to, it's like a big party celebration. I, I might have mentioned it in class before, but that they will be bringing Jewish people back into Israel on boats and all kinds of things, and it's going to be like a, a mega party of, of celebration, which tells us that people will be hiding and concealing and helping them during the tribulation, which is amazing. So, Hey, Pastor Nick. Um, I have two questions. So the first question is, you know, going back to your example about the jigsaw puzzle and how now we have the whole Bible, so we kind of see the cover of the jigsaw puzzle box and we know what the picture looks like. How were the people of the time back when the prophets were preaching and even Jesus able to connect with, aside from, you know, repenting from your daily day-to-day -day bad habits for righteousness because God's love you, how would they be able to connect with all these prophecies of what's gonna take place thousands of years ago when they have their own day-to-day -day troubles. And then the second question is from last week when you were mentioning, you know, John and his humanity was worried about who would open the seals and not have the knowledge that everyone will have when they get to heaven where they see the whole picture. When we get to heaven and we see whether it's the, re the flashback reel of our previous sins and ugliness or just the truth of the past of humanity, Will it be censored or filtered? Because how can we be in all this holiness and righteousness but see these ugly things? Will it be like decades ago when, you know, media was censored and if a woman's ankles were showing, like, oh, my goodness, like, will things be censored? Or is it because sin will be completely removed that we'll be able to see those ugly things, but it won't have an effect on us? Oh, the easy questions just keep coming and coming and coming. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine the Lord um, humiliating us, right? Um, especially in that environment, exposing us to, to shame and embarrassment. Um, so there are a lot of mysteries connected with that when it says that um, God will wipe away every tear from our eye. Is that, 
Is that all the disappointments of life? Is that things that, you know, we blew it, you know, if we had only lived better, this is what we could have achieved. I mean, is that what it will be? Will it be shame over things that we've known that we've done? I mean, we'll be in the resurrection, so it won't carry, I'm sure, the same sting as it, as it carries to us now in terms of regret, but we simply don't know. I mean, I, you know, Jesus is the kind of person I think that would review our lives in private and give us crowns in public. That just seems more like, like what he is. If there is shame, it's, it's shame that is um, measured in terms of the reward that he gives me or that he doesn't give me. It's not that he's going to cause me to be ashamed in front of others. I don't, I don't feel that he operates that way. Um, you know, Paul says that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So, you know, I'm sure that the Lord is able to do that for billions of people in a moment if he so chooses. How that will work, I, I don't know. So if the rapture were to happen, you know, right now in the next five seconds, sure, I mean, the Lord could, could give us that review instantaneously if he so desired, but I don't, I don't know if that's how it's going to work. So, yeah, so I don't know that I can give a better answer for that. As far as, as, far as the other uh, as far as the other question, I think we're always living in that tension between, you know, my daily life and, and the bigger picture, but, but they help each other. So in my daily life uh, and seeking to walk in holiness before God, part of that is that I have to live with an awareness that I have that appointment, that you know, I'm going to die, or, you know, even if, even if I'm a young person, Jesus might come next year. I may not live out my biblical lifespan, and so I'm always living, yeah, I'm living today, but I'm always living in the light of that day, and I don't know when that day is. You know, preachers always say, right, oh, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow, which is, I wish people would stop saying that, but it's, but it's true, Right? We, we don't know. We don't know how long we have, and we don't know when Jesus is coming. So we, we have to have a greater expectancy um, of that than I think we, we do typically. The other thing is I think they had an expectation. The Jewish people have always, I think, traditionally believed that Messiah could come in any generation, and I think, that, and I think that's wise. I think it's wise to think that, and I, and I think that you know, Jesus has always taught us not to just take his coming and tuck it away somewhere where we never think about it. But, you know, the most famous prayer of all Christians is the Lord's Prayer. And every time a person would pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying, thy kingdom come. And, and that's, that is a very vague thing for many people to pray. But if you pray it knowingly, it means that you're actually praying. Every time you're praying that, you're praying for all this stuff to happen. So that's a very different way. That's a very different way of, of looking at it. And, and that is the expectation. Now, maybe it was easy for Israel to focus on that because they so often in history, they're, they're small and they've been on the receiving end of all these persecutions. So it's it's easier for them than it would be for us in this room to, to pray um, with a sense of longing and desire and desperation that God would come and ransom them, not just from their sins, but give them relief from their, from their enemies. So even in the Christmas story, right, if you read those songs, those psalms of praise that happen at the beginning of the Christmas story, Zechariah and Mary, they are messianic, not just that Messiah is coming, but they're also messianic in the sense of the messianic hope. They talk about Israel being redeemed from all of its enemies, which is fascinating. And so that is part of Christmas that we just ignore. Gentile Christians just kind of zip right, like right over those as if it's just like, well, yeah, whatever. We don't, we don't worry about that part. Let's just get on to the tinsel. But that was a major part of the hope because Jesus' coming was not just to deliver us from sin, but especially if you're Jewish, 
that hope of national redemption is embodied in that person, in, in Christ. And we need to have the same thinking. So even when Paul is, is preaching to Gentile, to Greeks who don't know any of this, he's telling them about the resurrection and he's telling them that God has, you need to repent because God has appointed a day on which he's going to judge the world. And he's appointed a man to do that. And he's given proof of it by raising that man from the dead. That's fascinating. So usually when we, um, usually when people talk about that passage, they say, oh, Paul was mocked because he preached the resurrection and they'd never heard of that. That wasn't necessarily what was the, so uncomfortable for them. What Paul was preaching was not just the resurrection. Paul was preaching the day of the Lord. And that these Gentiles were going to have to stand in front of Jesus Christ to give an account of their life. So, yes, the, the truth of the resurrection, but the resurrection was God validating the fact that that man was the one appointed to bring the kingdom of God into the world. And who knew? Maybe very soon, you, you Greek friends of mine, Paul says, you're going to have to stand in front of this man that God has chosen to judge the world. That's awesome. And see, we have lost so much of that in our day in our gospel preaching. Where is that? Where, where is that preached in America to have that expectation, you know, that you must be ready, uh, whether you're a believer or especially if you're an unbeliever, that you must be ready because the day of the Lord is coming. So... Hello, my friend. Sorry, I'm so far back. It's all right. Uh, I have two questions also. Uh, like in the sixth seal, when it talks about the sun and all this, how do we know which things are allegorical and which things are not? Um, just in general, like you were saying, I think something will really happen uh, in the reference of the sixth seal, but I've always assumed that that one was not literal because, as you said, I mean, if, if we move a, a centimeter further from the sun or closer, it's cataclysmic to the point of no more life on Earth. So how can those two things hold? Um, and then the second question is, in the middle of the week, we have the Antichrist you know, declaring that he's greater than all other gods. And then also later on, we have people know that it is God causing all of this calamity on Earth. Um, at the time this is written, that would make a lot of sense, right? Because everyone believed in God's, whatever God that would have been. Now that's not the case. So is there, will there be a time where there's a, lack of a better term, like a spiritual awakening on earth where there are, where there's a general knowledge that yes, there is a God or there are gods for this Antichrist to be declaring himself greater than all of them. So is there kind of like a shift where people go from maybe more of a, an Eastern understanding of the world and, and God's versus a Western understanding? Yeah, very, very good, very good. So uh, I think you're absolutely correct because um, this is one of the reasons why Revelation has all those cutaway scenes in it because when we jump over to Revelation 13 and we see the ministries, if you want to use that word, of the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet, there is a worldwide uh, revival and revolution of evil. So, you know, you, you will not be able to come out with your, you know, um, evolutionary scientist video mocking God and so forth and mocking the supernatural. Why? Because the false prophet is going to have power to do demonic miracles, causing fire to come out of heaven and compelling people to worship the Antichrist and people, uh, people who have not read Matthew 24 are going to say, well, you see, this is real. All you Christians and whatever, all you this religion, that religion, you're all phonies and fake and nonsense. And you guys have been talking about Jesus coming forever and it's all a big joke, right? As the Bible says, they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? Because everything's just rolling on like it always has. But here's this new guy, and look, he really has real power. What he's saying must be true. Look, he can make fire come out of heaven and 
burn people up and so forth. And this, this guy, this new leader, you know, he has these amazing powers. And Paul says that the coming of, of the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is according to the power of Satan with all lying wonders and signs and so forth. So, so Jesus said false prophets and false Christs will arise and show great signs and wonders. He didn't say, you know, fake magic tricks. These are real demonic miracles that they will do and that will help and that will accelerate and even produce i would suggest you know what paul calls the great apostasy the great falling away all we're seeing now guys is just a generalized falling away now paul says that the spirit plainly says that in the latter days some will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits doctrines and things like that that's what we're living through right now. In, in the last 60, 80 years, we've been living through that. That is not the same thing as the great apostasy. Paul even says there's, there's a definite article, the, in 2 Thessalonians, he says, the great falling away. And the great falling away is caused by the ministry of the false prophet who does that, who causes people to believe in Antichrist and receive his mark. But there's another side to that, too, which is that the gospel is also going to go to every ethnic group. By the same token, um, the Bible says that, you know, in the last days, God says he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom, now that's very interesting. He didn't say the gospel of salvation. I'm, not that there are, are two gospels. There are not two gospels. So don't believe people who say that there's different gospels for different ages, okay? But emphasizing the kingdom and the coming of the kingdom of Christ, Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. Interesting, right? So... When I read Revelation 6 and I see these people knowing that it's the wrath of God and the Lamb, they know that because Christians, Jewish believers in Jesus, the two witnesses have been telling them that this is coming and you need to repent. So you have demonic miracles and you also have godly miracles being done by the two witnesses and others. So people are going to be blowing their minds and choosing up sides. So there's not going to be any more middle ground or you're not going to have the luxury of being a, an academic with your tweed jacket and with the elbow patches in your pipe saying that it's all ridiculous because you're going to be able to turn on CNN and see fire being called out of heaven from people by both sides. <laughs> so... Uh, the other question was about allegory. So um, I think some things are plainly symbol because we're told that they're symbol. Um, that would certainly be the case when you're talking about the beast with seven heads and ten horns. Like we know that there's not a, we know that a dinosaur is not coming out of the Mediterranean, right? Because, and we're told what the symbol means. Um, those seals, those horses, those those are metaphorical because... There is no person, you know, named famine or hell who's going to ride around the world killing people. It's speaking of the, of the effects of what is happening. But with the sixth seal, you have an event in terms of those earthquakes and so forth that are, are prophesied of throughout, in terms of, throughout the Bible, in terms of Yahweh doing something dramatic in nature. I mean, it's, it's all over. So, um, I mean... You know, John, I won't say John is borrowing, but he's hearing the same thing that Ezekiel's talking about, um, you know, worldwide earthquakes and, you know, great shaking in the land of Israel and Jerusalem's entire geography being changed to be completely unrecognizable compared to what it is now. So, so I have to believe that those are literal events that are going to happen uh, on the earth. I mean, I think I read that. The, the largest river in the world is, is actually underground on the Sinai. It goes under that whole part of the world. So when God shakes all that up, then the desert, the Aralah, is going to blossom like a rose. Why? Well, because there's a, just this 
fathomless quantities of water that are under there waiting for Messiah to come to spring up and turn that entire part of the world into a garden. So, so I do feel that those things are, are literal, that they are physical. I think we give them the plain sense. Now, it gets trickier later in the book, right? People always want to argue, oh, demonic locusts coming out of the abyss. Are those really demons? Are they helicopters? I think they're demons, right? So people will debate on those things, and uh, I think we'll, we'll find out, right? <laughs> so, hello, my brother. Does the rapture occur before the tribulation? And that's the first question. The second is, do the Jewish people believe in Revelation? Since it, Isaiah mentioned it and so forth. Well, the Jewish people don't believe in the book of Revelation, right? Because it's, because it's Christian scripture. So, you know, what Jewish people say about the New Testament is uh, anything, anything that's good in it is old and anything that's, uh, you know, that's new in it is, is not good. <laughs> so, but, uh, so they don't accept any of the books uh, of the New Testament at all. So, I mean, the, the, fact, the fact that it alludes to scenarios from the Old Testament would just cause an unbelieving Jewish person to say, well, you're just borrowing or stealing from our scriptures and you're, you know, you're cobbling something together to support your own view. The issue is Jesus Christ. Is he the Christ or not? And then because... Obviously, Revelation asserts that he is the Christ, then they don't accept it. So, um, as far as the rapture, does the, you, does the rapture come before the seven years or not? So, the Assemblies of God thinks it does. Uh, others do not. So, um, we won't settle that tonight. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I can, say that, um, I can say that the early church... Uh, did not believe that it was before the tribulation, but you know we should all we should all be convinced by from scripture. Yeah, why would God put us put Christians through this? Why would God put Christians through that? Well, um, that's not really, I think, the best way to ask the question because I could ask that question of Christians that are being tortured at this minute in North Korea. Uh, in the Muslim world, in China, in India, in Africa, and all around the place. So it's like, doesn't God love them? I mean, they're, they're dying for their faith as well. Um, you know, so we saw in, in Revelation 2 and 3 how the Lord said that he, he chastens everyone, that um, he chastens every son that he has. So if he needs to bring any of us through things in life to purify us, he will do that because, because he loves us. And, you know, to, to the extent that God is dealing with the Jewish people in that time, um, he will still need people to provoke them to jealousy and, and to help them. So um, you can see that there are Christians there in Revelation during that time, whether they are Christians that are saved now already or will be saved later which some people call tribulation saints that is something that people argue about but you can see um, Daniel says very plainly that um, that that th this beast is going to make war against the saints and overcome them on until the Messiah comes so um, it's it's a very it's a very long <laughs> uh, discussion um, and and debate. We did a whole video uh, about it. We took a whole night to talk about that in the prior class. But so in rapture, only so many will be raised. Well, no. The, when the rapture happens, all Christians who are then living will. That is the resurrection for us, no matter when it occurs. So 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says then, you know, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so who remains? Who remains? Yeah. Well, when he's saying remains there, he means Christians who are, who are living, who are then living on the earth. Well, no, all no, all living Christians at that time when Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise, 
And then Paul says, we who are alive and remain, so you remain alive to that point, you will be changed and be resurrected without having to die at but that this point. Is after, after the tribulation. This is when, when he comes. Well, that's what the debate is about. So that's what the debate is about. So On the, uh, I, need, I need you to take the mic for our, for our friends that follow us in Australia. Okay. On the subject of the Lord's Prayer and the Day of the Lord. Can it also be said that it's, it's not exclusive to the day of the Lord that he's speaking that? I mean, because he wants his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So is that not also meaning winning souls for Christ and bringing his kingdom and being one in him? Is it also, I, I'm assuming it does, but I just want to clarify that. Yeah, well, certainly, whenever a person comes to faith in Jesus, I mean, we do, we do come under the dominion of his kingdom. But I do not believe that that's what that prayer has in mind. When it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, God's will is, is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. And it won't be until Jesus comes. You know, to rule the nations. You, when you're praying that, you are praying for Messiah to come and rule the nations with a rod of iron. You're praying for Psalm 2. You're praying for the installation of Messiah as the ruler over the earth. No, as, as I'm saying, there is, a, there is a dimension in which, of course, we do experience the kingdom, right? We experience the life of the kingdom in, our, in ourselves, in our personal lives. But that is not the same thing as the kingdom of God coming on, on the earth, right? Because we, we don't have, you, you need to have the king in order to have the kingdom and he's not yet exercising his reign over the planet as he will be one day. So, so until we get to that point, we're still kind of in this in-between, between the ages kind of experience. And, and yes, Paul does say that God has transferred or raptured us or translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of his beloved son. Yes, for sure. So I am now a citizen of the kingdom of God. But that kingdom is not hold sway in, in a manifest and physical way in this earth. That, that doesn't happen. God doesn't make that move until the seventh trumpet. We'll read about that uh, when we get to Revelation 11. That's when God says, okay, we're not, we're not delaying this project any longer. And the, blow that trumpet and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So until that happens, Jesus will not be directly, he's still allowing us to reign as, as human beings, but you know, our, our time of, you know, pretty soon though, all those signs will go up, you know, planet earth under new management. So <laughs> looking forward to that. Anybody else? Okay, well, this, this is good stuff. So next week we are going to, we're going to, we, you know, believe it or not, we're more than halfway done already and we're only in chapter six, but uh, we will move a little more quickly from this point forward. So we will look at, um, I think we'll be able to get in all the trumpets next week. So um, thank you guys and thanks for the, for the great questions too. Bless you.